If you wondered why we were singing Christmas songs in July, you're about to find out. I'm going to share it with you. It goes with the message. But before I get into the sermon, what I would like to do is to say a prayer with all of you on behalf of our country and and on behalf of the politics happening in our nation. And I would like to pray for uh, all of the things that, that we experienced yesterday, that people saw yesterday. And, and before I pray, I want, I want you all to know that, that violence in politics should never, ever be. We, we, we have developed a sense of democracy so that we can come together and reason things out and vote in things. And there are so many nations in our world and so many that have existed since history, and they don't have democracy. They don't have the opportunity to vote. They don't have the, the amendments like freedom of religion or the freedom to share their opinion. And, and because we have those, no matter how discouraging things get or no matter how, many, how hopeless or how mad that anybody ever gets. It is never, ever right to resort to violence ever. And as Christians, what we always should do is, is, is seek to be peacemakers. I'm, I'm so grateful that God miraculously saved Donald Trump's life yesterday. I'm so grateful because I, I, I wouldn't have wanted our, I, I, I've never seen a president assassinated, but my parents did, and my grandparents did. And to see somebody murdered on live TV and to experience something like that just would have been absolutely traumatic. And so I join with all of the voices who are saying, thank God for preserving life yesterday, because it was so, so very close. And, and, and I believe that what Jesus Christ would have the church to do is to rise up and to say to the rest of our world that there is a different way and to denounce any kind of things that are violent and, and, and horrible. And, and I pray this for, for Donald Trump as he continues that he would be safe. I pray it for all of our political leaders as they're going through their, their campaigns and speeches and, and rallies and meeting people all the time. Um, I pray that all of them are safe in the middle of such polarized ugliness that, 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 that our politicians would, would just be jeered and hurt and, and, and all of these things. I, I lift that up. I, I lift up um, Terry Wilson, my great, great friend who is running for, for office that the Lord will keep him safe and all of the politicians running and Joe Biden as he runs. What we want is to have a, an election that is free and right and speaks on behalf of the people. That's what we should have. And that's the right thing. And so y'all join me in a moment and, and we pray. And I wanna say this, if you'll come on Wednesday at noon in the Koinonia room, I'm also going to pr- be leading a time of prayer in there as we pray for our, our nation as well and praying that they will be safe. And, uh, and, and as we pray for all these, please, please be in prayer for, for our beloved church member who, are, who is here and his family as he runs for office in a very controversial, difficult time as well. We love you, Wilson family. Y'all are amazing. We love you. Thank you. And we're grateful for people who run for office in the middle of these things. Isn't that right, y'all? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, only you can bring such a, a violent and, and messed up nation and world together. I, I pray, Lord, that if any politician or media group or anybody exacerbates these problems by the things that they say, uh, that, that, that they breed more violence and they'll say things like, well, if somebody's going to do this, then we're going to do this kind of a thing. Lord, as we pray that as Christians, we will never, ever contribute to that. Never, Father. May, may we oppose it on all of our social media. May we be aware, Lord, when we see things that actually propagate more violence and cause more problems. And Father, may we be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Help Christians to rise up here in our nation and throughout the world. And Lord, to speak peace 
and to speak hope in the middle of a hopeless world. Father, we pray that you'll protect people from violence and all of these things. We worry about them. We pray for them. We know that they have families. We know, Father, that the other side that so often we stereotype as being evil or being wrong, we know that they have children. We know, Father, that many of them um, are, are, are doing the very best that they can. And, and so, Lord, we pray for a sense of civility. Lord, we pray for a sense of peace. And we ask you, Lord, that First Baptist Marble Falls, that, that the way we conduct ourselves in our community, the way that we will talk about all of this tomorrow when we go to work and with our family members and everyone, that, that we will do well, that we will watch our words. And Lord, that we will watch the things that we post. May we be light in this world because we are on a journey of light becoming like you. In Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 Thank you guys. I hope you'll come on Wednesday at noon and, and join me. Well, y'all, all right. Are, are y'all growing spiritually in this sermon series at all? Watching, I'm glad. I'm glad we're, we're, we're studying the main major movements of God as we trace the grand story from Genesis to Revelation and trying to identify where we fit in that story. We're not only looking at the story, but we're moving to a, a real life and practical application of it so that we will be able to see our part in that story. When the chapter of our life opens up and we're caught up in the middle of this wonderful story of the Lord that we get to see how we fit into all of it as well. And I want you to play your part well. God is calling you to play your particular part in the movement of Jesus Christ and to play your part well. And God will empower you to do it. And, and we've, we've broken this story into several chapters or what we're calling Acts and Act 1, the curtain lifted on the creation story. And then the second act was sin and the fall. And then we took a back uh, uh, from looking at the Acts and we looked at the covenants of God because by looking at the Abraham covenant and the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, all of these, we were able to see what God was doing in Acts 3, 4, 5, and then into the future, even unto what we're studying today. We came back and we looked at Act 3, which was Moses leading the people out of slavery and leading them into the promised land and giving them the law. And then Lane preached um, on the next act, Act 4, which is setting up a nation of Israel based in that law and giving them the kings, King Solomon and King David and all of them. And then last week, we looked at how that nation fell so dramatically, just collapsed, and, and how the kings led and allowed the people to disobey. And they disobeyed by idolatry, worshiping other gods, and by injustice, not caring about people and loving people. And so God allowed them to go into captivity by allowing another nation, the Babylonian nation, to come in and, and, and very um, tragically, very violently destroy the Israelite people. And it took them into exile. And what historians call the 70-year Babylonian captivity of the church. And then during that time, um, what we read is that God preserved a remnant for them. And we studied how they, uh, how they came back and how God led the Persians to defeat the Babylonians and God's people came back. And Cyrus the Great said, I want you to go back and, and Nehemiah and Ezra lead this small group of people that are called the remnant, the small group of Israelites back to start rebuilding everything. And during this time, now they are back and they're starting to rebuild it all God continues to send them prophets. There were four prophets who came and spoke to them after they got back after the exile. Haggai, Zechariah, Joel, and Malachi. And if you ever want to read something that's really about the grace of God and how much God loves people and his faithfulness, read Zechariah chapter 3, where God restores the priest and the leaders of Israel. And so uh, the, the, these messages of the prophets then started to, to talk about the future king who would come in the line of David and that he would be the great Messiah for the Israelite people, but not just for them, be the Messiah for me and you, 
the Messiah for the whole world. The remnant of Israel had been through so much and now they get this, this promise that God was gonna send a Messiah to be the king of kings through them. And here is where the Old Testament comes to an end. The last, last thing that the Old Testament says, the last chapter in the book of Malachi says, and I promise I'm going to send a new Elijah and he is gonna come and he's gonna preach and prepare for the day of the Lord. And what he is talking about is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the the Elijah who was going to come and he would prepare the way for the day of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. So the way the Old Testament ends is by promising and, and prophesying about John the Baptist coming and about Jesus Christ. And so then that prophecy happens at the very end of Malachi. And then they have 400 years that go by before Matthew and before Luke and the gospels before Jesus comes. 400 years of what is called silence. In between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years, the, the United States of America has only been here for a little over 200 years. Can you imagine 400 years, twice, everything that we know as a country, two times that, they were waiting, waiting for the Messiah to come after the book of Malachi. And, and we call it the 400 silent years because it's in between the Old and New Testament, but really a lot happened during that time. When they came back, the Persians were the ones in control, but the Greeks and Alexander the Great came and he took over everything. And so the Greeks took over. There was a, during that moment, there was a horrible Greek general named Antichus Epiphanes. And he came and, and he tried to destroy the Israelites. He got a pig and burnt it on their altar. And man, the, 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 the Jewish people, God told them, never ever even get close to pigs. And he came and he, he, he had one um, sacrificed on the Jewish altar where they sacrificed to God. In the book of Daniel, it's called the abomination of desolation. It was a horrible moment. And so all of the Israelites rebelled against the Greeks and a, and a family called the Maccabees. How many of you ever heard of the Maccabees? Almost, oh, good, good. A lot of you, some of you haven't. The Maccabees were during this silent 400 years and this was such a powerful family that they rallied all of Israel together, kind of like the old judges, like, like Deborah and Samson and Gideon did, Gideon did in the book of Judges. The Maccabees were like this and they were so powerful. They, they rallied Israel to fight against the Greeks. There was one Maccabean in particular named Judas Maccabeus. Does his name sound great? Judas Maccabeus. His, his name means the hammer. And he led Israel to fight against Antichus Epiphanes and all of the Greeks. And Judas Maccabeus won. He led them to victory and it was awesome. So they defeated the Greeks, but then another group came, the Romans. They defeated the Greeks, and then the Romans have control of everything. And there is a sect that begins to arise during this time called the Pharisees, Sadducees. There's another group called the Essenes, and all of the different groups in Israel begin to emerge during this, this time, um, during this 40 years. But those years were mainly typified by years of waiting, 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 watching, watching, trying to be faithful, trying to do what God wanted them to do. Today, we are going to look at the space between the promise and the fulfillment. And we're gonna enter into this space in between this 400 years. And we're gonna experience the excitement of the promise. This is what I am gonna do in waiting patiently for that. And so turn your Bibles with me to first the promise, the, the, the prophetic word that Jesus is gonna come in Isaiah chapter nine. Isaiah chapter nine. The Bernard family are gonna come and read to us this passage of scripture. They're going to first read the, the promise, which is Isaiah nine verses six through seven. And then um, Katie and Reese are going to read the fulfillment, which is Luke chapter two. So you're gonna take the prophecy that Jesus will come, Isaiah nine, and link it to Luke chapter two, Christmas. 
the day that Jesus comes and fulfills Isaiah 9. So y'all stand up with me. We're gonna read this together. Here we go. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter nine. If you're struggling finding Isaiah, it is to the right of Psalms and Proverbs. And, uh, and, and you'll see it. It is um, gonna be right in there. It's before you get to all the little minor prophets. If you get to Daniel, Zechariah, Haggai, Mali, any of those, go, go back to the left. It's right there. It's one of the big, big prophets. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. All right, Brad. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. All right, step up, Katie, but hold on. A son, unto you a son is born, unto you a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. Doesn't that sound good? Oh my goodness. He will be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father, talking about Jesus, prophesying Jesus to come. So now we wait. We wait. When? When, Lord, the governments are crashing around us, nothing is going right. When? When, God? And when the time was finally right, Luke chapter 2, Katie. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel appeared, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Great job. Great job. Isn't it cool to hear Christmas right now? Ah, it feels so good. All right, Bernard family, we love you. Brad and Katie, man, we love y'all so much. And kids, Heavenly Father, thank you for these passages that describe salvation, your salvation story, salvation history. We we find, Lord, that it, it resonates with us. We find, Father, that we have a lot of similarities with the Israelites, that we too find ourselves in places of waiting. Lord, speak to us now as we examine this and as we grow from it. Give us something we can hold on to, something we can sink our teeth into, and Lord, something that that we actually will remember and it will affect this upcoming week in our life. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. This is salvation history, salvation story. God did it. He promised that when he brought about Abraham and created the family around Abraham, that he was going to bring about the Messiah through him and that through this family, that that they would be a blessing to the entire world. And now they finally have. It took 2,000 years, 2,000 years and through slavery and coming out of slavery and all of the tribalism and all of the kings and all of the ups and downs and all of the issues and exile. It took a long, long time. And somehow 
God preserved this family for all of those years. And it blows my mind that this particular family, this people group is still alive with a nation and still practicing and worshiping God today. I'm amazed by it. The oldest, oldest people group that is still intact and, and, and still together is this group. God preserved them and he brought about his son through this particular family. But here's the thing, the, the, the promise that the Messiah was gonna come and Luke 2, when he did come, was a long, long time. And they dealt with a lot of suffering and they dealt with a lot of issues. And, and here is the problem that I'm struggling with and that maybe all of you can help me with. It's not just... That, that, that things are often difficult in my life or, or difficult in y'all's life. But sometimes the thing that really gets me is the duration of the difficulty. It's how long a tr certain trouble and how long the messiness continues, continues to last. All of us say with our own words and we hear all the time things like, how long will we experience this mess? When? Will it be better? When will it be fixed? I'm ready for all of this to be over. I remember during COVID-19, how often we were using phrases like that. When will this be over? Now, now God doesn't cause all of the pain or all of the suffering, and he does promise a victory. But the question that we often have for God is, Lord, how long until you bring the victory? How long? And we never know. We never know exactly how long God's going to wait before he does that. We don't know how long our season of disorientation might last. We never know, and neither did anybody in the Bible. Moses didn't know, and Abraham didn't know. The people of God didn't know. Psalm 13 really does resonate with us, where the psalmist says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long must I live in sorrow? The, the idea, how long will our world and our nation or ourselves or my family and these things, how long, Lord, until you make something better? And the people of God had this promise about their future. Malachi and in Isaiah chapter nine, this person is going to come and he's going to be the Messiah. The Messiah's on the way. But now they had to have the patience of waiting, waiting faithfully and, and, and God was building them up in it. They, the remnant people were much more faithful than the people before them, um, but still they had to wait. Are y'all good at waiting? On a, on a scale of one to 10, are, 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 if, if, if one being, you are not patient at all, you're a bad waiter. And, and 10 being you're mature and you handle things well when things don't go right and you're able to endure and be patient. Where do y'all sit? If, if you have Luke uh, or, or Isaiah 9 on one side, that God's gonna come in as Messiah and save and work, but then Luke 2, when he does come in, if you have to rest in the middle of this 400 years, are you good at that? Are you a good rester in it? I, I think... As Christians today, we share this a little bit. The ancient people, these people here, they were waiting for Jesus to come the first time, but we're waiting as well, aren't we? We're, we're waiting for Jesus to return and we're having to be patient and wait for his return. They were in the middle of Isaiah 9 and Luke 2, but we are in the middle of Matthew 28 when Jesus ascends into heaven and, and Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that says that on the right day, the trumpet call of God will sound and the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ will rise. And after that, we too who are with them will also rise as well. This is the great moment when Jesus returns. The Messiah is going to come back. We rest in the middle of this age in the same way that they were trying to wait and rest in the middle of their age. So both of us have to figure a way to be patient in this moment. And I think as Christians today, we really do 
need to develop a, a, a better and a deeper kind of patience because we want everything so fast. We get everything so fast. We are, we are very conditioned to get things very quickly. And it's hard for us to be patient. I've noticed that there are, there are two kinds of waiting. There is faithful waiting. And then on the other side, there, there is three-year-old waiting. Three-year-old waiting. In, in the 1970s and 80s, parents would, would leave their kids in the car a lot. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it was against the law, no matter how hot it was. Um, and, and, and parents would go in and do things. My, my mom would say, I'm going into the bank. Y'all wait in the car and behave. I'm going in to go grocery shopping. Y'all wait in the car and, and behave. And here's how hard it was for us as children to wait and behave. My mom would say, okay, I'm gonna go into the grocery store, y'all wait and behave, and I'm gonna get you something special. And if I get back and find that you have behaved, I'm going to give you that, that prize. And I don't ever remember getting the prize. <laughs> and y'all, we were left in the car a lot. And there are four of us, Ross, Robin, Rachel, Ryan. I mean, we, we, and we lived way, way out on a ranch. We didn't get to see town sometimes for a week. And so, man, it's like, God, oh, the bank is awesome. Woo, bank. And I mean, and, and, and it, was, it was like that. And so we, we were left in the car. Parents in the 80s and 70s, they left kids in the car. You may have been to HEB lately and you may have wished that certain parents would have left their children <laughs> in the car too. But I, I, I remember never getting the prize. I mean, she, she would get back and there was always one of my siblings were crying and, and she says, what happened? And it's like, so-and-so hit me and they crushed me down into the floorboard and made me stay there the whole time. And, and, and or so they would, she would get back and something in the car would be broken. You know, the thing that you hang hangers on, you, we're playing this broken or the tape cassette doesn't work anymore. I don't know how I did the, and, or, or she would get back and somebody had gotten out of the car and gone and, and, and was riding the little mechanical horse um, at the front of the grocery stores that we had in the 80s. The three-year-old, three-year-old waiting is a kind of restless, restless anxiety filled with boredom and filled with, with causing trouble, causing trouble and hopelessness and, and frustration. And the people of God had to fight that kind of thing. They had to learn a different way to wait on God without all of the anxiety, without allowing their frustrations to cause them to act poorly and to make bad choices or to allow in their boredom that they started to do things that they shouldn't do in their boredom. There is a kind of waiting that is important, a kind of waiting that God can work and do something in our life. The way, all of you are going to have to wait. All of you have to wait on something. The question is, the way that you wait is going to make a difference in your life. The way that you wait, the way that you are patient is either going to be a blessing to you or it's going to bring curses and difficulty to your life. So y'all, we, just, just like they, we have to fight against the three-year-old waiting part of us. And the whole Bible is filled with stories about humans demanding of God. When, Lord, when? When, when are you going to make things better? Do it now. Do it now. And it often results in really violent or horrible or self-destructive or immoral or unethical choices that, that all the time bring pain and suffering. Bad choices when you are waiting for God to do something. And when you're, you're just there, we make bad choices. And then we bring more pain and more suffering on our life. And, and our language, we only have one word for time, and this is kind of how we deal with it. It's called chronos. 
chronos time. And it's the kind of time that we look at our watches or that we look at our calendar and we measure days and weeks and months and years and decades. Chronos, you and I, naturally in our culture, we measure how we are doing and what we are doing by chronos. We're going to have a meeting at three o'clock next Wednesday. Chronos rules the way that we think. We have something, somebody makes a promise to you and the promise is we're going to go and do this thing or do this, well, when? Well, next week, we're going to do it then. We always measure our promises in terms of chronos. God is not like that. He measures his promises in terms of another Greek word. We only have one word, the Greeks have two. Their other word is called kairos, and it's very, very different. Kairos does not indicate any kind of time on a watch or a calendar. Kairos is when God watches society, and he watches culture, and he watches how people are are acting with one another, and he watches the movements and the technology that's being brought in, and and the developments. And when the culture is right, when the people are right, when their heart is right, then, then God fulfills his promises. God is not watching a calendar, and he's not checking with all of us to see if it fits our schedule. God, in his kairos, watches our heart. Kairos is a heart kind of thing when you are ready in your heart and in your mind. And when we start to look at everything and try to wait patiently, the way that you wait patiently is you throw Kronos out and you stop holding God accountable to a calendar. And instead you begin reflecting on your own heart and your own mind. God, where am I? Am I ready for you to show up? Have, have I been to the altar lately? Have I prayed and read? Is my heart right? God is saying, ah, now you're getting kairos right, what I, what I want. We start looking at ourselves and at our heart because that's what God is looking at. The timing of God and the way to wait on the timing of God that grows our faith is this kind of thing. And I, I believe that few things in life are as effective in maturing and growing a a Christian well as wading through difficulty. Having to wait, you can't fix it. You can't expedite it. You can't jump over it and you can't go around it. Like the old children's book, you gotta go through it. And you just walk through it, walk through it, wait it, but you do it well. You don't complain the whole time. You don't make everybody else miserable and you're waiting. You're mature. You're like Christ and you wait well. And in that place, when we find ourselves waiting well, then, then, then the Lord says, okay, now I can bring about things. I see your heart. And God was waiting and, and, and helping them to, to be ready for him. And here's what Psalm 31 says. But I trust in you, O Lord. And I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Lord, we trust you. My life, the life of our church, it's in your hands. This is, this is why we cannot manufacture by our own strength what's called revival. Now, we can have a revival and bring a special speaker in. It could be the best speaker of all time, the best preacher, the best band. We could have prayer meetings and do all of these things. But, but, but when the Lord really shows and when he really comes, he is waiting for y'all's hearts and mine to be ready to hear from him. The kairos of God looks at all of us in that way. So we trust in God and we draw near to him and we wait on the Lord. And, and I know it's hard. There is something about God's standard time that's hard but we synchronize our our hearts to it and we synchronize our minds to it as we get on board with God's standard time. In my life, I've tried to learn it. I've tried to learn God's standard time and it has been hard at times. Um, I, I have been deeply in love with Megan for a long, long, long time. She and I met when we were in the second grade. I was always smitten with her. 
But when I was in the fifth grade, I did something where um, I carved something in my wall of the house where I grew up. This is a part of the wall in the house where I grew up. It was painted over white, but before it was painted over white, it was brown and it was just brown paneling. I got a pocket knife for Christmas. And when I was in the fifth grade, I carved in this panel, R plus M equals L. I have it up in my office. And, and Ross plus Megan equals love. And I carved that there in the fifth grade. I didn't know what love was. I didn't have, have a clue, man, what love was at that time. But y'all know something? The, after we graduated and we were both gonna go to Hardin-Simmons University, I did have a greater understanding what love was going into our freshman year. And, and, and my love for her grew immensely during those years as she was a youth minister and I was a youth minister. And I, I, was, I felt in my heart like she was absolutely the one for me. And I was in love with her big time during that time. And before we went into HSU, had she wanted to, I would have said, we're getting married. We're going to the justice of the peace. It's a done deal. And, and I was ready. I'm, I'm ready to you know, cross that line. And, and God's timing was not right then. And God said, I need you to wait. I need you to grow. God knew something that I did not know. Megan probably knew it. My, my, my family knew it, but what they knew, somebody knows where, where I'm heading here with this. God knew that I was not a mature person at the time. Uh, if I had gotten Megan when I wanted her, she would have broken up with me in a month flat. I needed the Lord to work. I needed to become somebody worth marrying. Dr. Shields in a class at Hardin Simmons told all of us, he said, you know, a lot of you guys, a lot of you boys are looking for somebody to marry. I want you to know that before you look for somebody to marry, you need to practice being somebody worth marrying. And so I had to become somebody worth marrying. And it was on God's standard time, not mine. God's standard time is not efficient. God's standard time is harder. It's harder than even spring forward time. The time that's the worst in the year. And I don't know why that day always happens on Sundays, spring forward, but God's standard time is even harder than that one. It's never convenient. It's always difficult. And we all want to cry out, how long, how long? But right there in the middle of our 400 years with the Israelites holding Isaiah 9 in one hand and Luke 2 in the other, or for us holding Matthew 28 in Revelation when Jesus comes back in the other, right here, I, I just want to implore all of you to realize that when God comes. It is always appropriate and always right and beautiful. It is just perfect when he comes. Luke 2 begins, and it's talking about the timing of all of it. And, and it's talking about um, here's who's in charge of what, and here's the politics of the day. And it's trying to say in the context, here's the perfect timing of the Lord. When Jesus arrived, it was, it was right where it needed to be. So Luke describes the situation and all of Israel would have had him come sooner. But had Jesus come sooner, it would not have worked out. Um, this is how it had to happen. And so everything happened so uniquely. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the place that the prophets said the new king who was going to be the Messiah had to be born. Well, how in the world do you get a very, very poor Joseph and Mary, get them to Bethlehem when they lived in Nazareth? They, they, they couldn't make the trip. Mary was pregnant. She would not have made the trip. How do you get them there? Politics. You create a certain, you allow a certain Caesar, Augustus, who issues a decree in the whole Roman world that a census should be ha happening. And everybody had to go to their hometown to register. So now Joseph has to go to Bethlehem. He has no idea what God is doing. God's kairos is working. 
the moment where Jesus is going to be born, it's the right timing. And God uses the politics, uses the census that Luke talks about to get them to this place. And they get to Bethlehem. Now it's everything is right. God, in his timing, did not allow her to have the baby on the road with just the donkey that was there and Joseph having to deliver the baby. God allowed them to get into this place and they get to Bethlehem and Bethlehem was their hometown. There's other relatives coming in. Joseph knows people. Mary knows these people. Because of that, I know what you're thinking. Some of you think, well, if they had all these relatives who were there, why in the world did she have a baby way out in a cave somewhere behind in some kind of stable? Why, why that? Well, the reality, y'all, is she probably didn't. The, we, we, I have nativity sets and I love to look at them, but the way that some nativity sets kind of present this story, it really may not have happened like that. Well, what may have happened, what probably happened is there was one humble inn and because a lot of people were there, there wasn't enough room, but there were relatives everywhere, people that they knew, um, people he had grown up with. And so he'd go to these relatives and they helped him to find a place. The ones who did not have a room would say, well, we don't have one. Hey, but, but, but my uncle does. And Joseph says, oh, that sounds good. Let's go there. They get to the place of a relative's house. And in that culture, they either kept animals in one of the rooms of the houses or a lot of people kept animals just in a little adjacent barn right next to the house, but it belonged to relatives. It belonged to people that they knew. And so the relatives got together. They cleaned out that room for Mary where all of the animals were or that adjacent barn where all the animals were. And then they came and they helped Mary. They were a part of the whole thing. God's perfect timing. Well, where are we going to lay the baby? God's perfect timing. Here is a place you can lay the baby. It's the trough. Everybody bring rags and bring old shirts and gowns, put it all in there. Look, it's perfect. God's perfect timing made it all happen. A great place for a baby to be born. Humble, yes. Poor, yes. But perfect. All the family was there. And they all came and they celebrated that this child would be born. And then the shepherds show up and they're celebrating it all too. Galatians 4 says it like this. When the time had finally come, God sent his son born of a woman. In another version, it says in the fullness of time, that's Kairos. When Jesus came into our world. Now there's so much more that we can say about this story. But here's what Christmas does for all of us today. And even after coming out of tomorrow, and that near tragedy and all of the things that we're worried about, Christmas reminds us that something else is at work in our broken world. It reminds us that something else is moving here, that God is here. And because God is here, then you can take all the problems that you and all of our seven and a half billion people have in all the nations of our world. You can take all the problems, compile them together, and they are still not big enough to overcome what God did in Jesus Christ. He, and so here is the gospel. I, I just want you to know that if you are living out a kind of broken waitingness, waiting for a job or waiting for something to be fixed, or waiting for the politics to be exactly what you want them to be in our world. If you're waiting on all of these things, and, and, and you're, if you will allow God to work on your heart in the middle of all of that, and to help allow God to help you to be patient, then God is going to show up in your life exactly the way that he has always shown up in history. And he's going to bring victory and he's going to bring good things if we will wait on the Lord. What do y'all say? Y'all want to do it? Let's wait on the Lord properly and rightly with our God. So would you bow your heads with me?